Welcome to the Expanding Worlds podcast. I'm your host, Deborah Caldo. And today is a continuation of my series on planning the journey. In this series, I'm sharing my own experiences of the four areas that the podcast focuses around, daily living, relationships, purpose, and financial. And this episode, the topic's relationships. And if I'm honest, I find this the most challenging area of the four. This is really all about our unique lived experiences. And while other people will say they understand, I think this is the one area that is really most unique to every one of us. And this is partly because we all have different experiences of family, of friends, and how they've supported us or haven't supported us. And as you listen to this, you may have an amazingly supportive family or a group of friends or the complete opposite, or more likely, as it was for me, fall somewhere in the middle. Some very supportive family and friends and other people who've fallen by the wayside because I simply didn't have the time to educate them about the challenges my daughter was facing every day. However, even with our differences, I hope that some of the ideas I'm going to talk about will resonate because I've tried to combine my own experiences with my daughter with the wisdom of the many people I've had on the podcast who've talked about relationships. So let's start with family and specifically talk about siblings. My daughter has an older sister and she's been an asset, especially in the early years in terms of modelling behaviour and just being someone my daughter could look up to. I know she loves her sister but it's true she has struggled sometimes. It's hard growing up anyway, but when your home life isn't like your peers, that makes it even more of a roller coaster to navigate. They do have a great relationship now, but it wasn't always like that. I often hear people say, well, my other children will look after my child with additional needs. I'm not going to sit on the fence here. I don't believe that is the best option long-term for either of my daughters. Whilst my oldest would do it, perhaps partly out of obligation, but mostly out of love, my youngest would hate it. Depending on her sister? No way. She's fought hard and longed to be on her sister's level, to be treated just like her sister. She wouldn't want to spend her life being dependent on her sibling and being told what to do by her. And my older daughter? Well, she shouldn't have to be responsible for her younger sibling. I know many people will not agree with my stance on this and will say, well, that's what families are about. Absolutely, it is about looking out for each other. But there's a big difference between that and being asked to effectively parent your sibling. A parent's role is to bring their children up the best way they know how and then let them live their own lives. I don't want to dictate the future for either of my daughters. Of course, guiding my youngest on her journey is going to be a lifetime task. But if I do it right, then her relationship with her sibling will be one of mutual consent. Yes, my older daughter will have an important role when I'm no longer around, but it won't be as a carer, more as a mentor, as many siblings are towards each other. I totally appreciate that you may not agree with me, but I would say that it's also important to reflect on what kind of relationship we want siblings to have with each other. Because one built on care is, in my opinion, better than one built on being a carer. And what of other family members? Well, like probably all of you listening, there have been good times and bad times. I've often put the challenges down to lack of understanding, because I think we still live in a world where individuals like my daughter are othered. I really can't offer advice here because I've not always got it right myself. I've always tried to educate family members who don't seem to get it. But as I've said before, my priority has always been my daughter. So what about our friendships? Well, I can't lie, my friendship circle severely contracted when I had my daughter. I think it was a combination of many factors. As a family, we were consumed by everything, medical appointments, constant worry about her health. And we hadn't even got to the bit where we started to worry about her future at that point. And let's be honest, you don't have that part where people come round to see the new baby. I guess people are scared about saying the wrong thing. In a similar way, people tend not to visit people when they have an illness like cancer. What do you say? How can you help? Well, if there happens to be anyone listening here who's in that position, take it from me. You should just go and visit because they need you. They need that bit of reassurance to know that friends are nearby. When my first daughter was born, the greatest thing a friend did for me was turn up unannounced on the doorstep with coffee and croissants. And that would have been equally amazing if someone had done that when my second daughter was born. But another reason I've lost friends is because I've chosen to exclude people from my life to protect my daughter. My daughter was bullied in her first school and it lost me one friend who up until that point I'd considered a good friend. But because it was one of her children that was involved in the group bullying situation and my daughter has developmental language disorder so couldn't say what was happening to her every day in the playground. Thankfully, another friend had a child who had the strength to step away and tell their parents what was happening. There were a number of children involved in this incident, and there was a clear gap between those parents who chose to discuss it with their children and those parents who were in denial, as my ex-friend was. So what about our friendships? Well, it's inevitable, I suppose, that we find friends with similar interests. Now, I'm not suggesting our children are an interest, 
But for me, I've often found that it's been a factor that's brought me together with other parents. I still have friends today where our children no longer see each other, but our friendship continues. Thankfully, it's also moved on from talking about our kids, but this shared journey is the basis of the friendship. And my long-term friendships that have endured were there with those people who did try to understand, that came around and tried desperately not to say the wrong thing. They're the ones who ask how she's doing and who share the joy in seeing her become more independent, who treat her like an individual. And when it comes to looking at relationships and how we navigate them, one way is to divide them into what I call dynamic and static. Dynamic relationships change and develop and static are always the same. So dynamic relationships will be those closer, more familiar relationships with family that will extend to friends and possibly later on work colleagues. Static relationships don't change as much. They're almost the same each time we have a conversation, for example. They're more transactions than relationships. However, they're still interpersonal interactions which need to be conducted in a certain way. These are often more related to those daily living skills like shopping or travelling where we're interacting with other people day to day. Of course, occasionally a static relationship becomes more, especially if we live in a community, but many of the interactions we all have day to day are static relationships. And each of these different types of relationships needs different skills and different scripts. Possibly the easiest way to tell and teach the difference is to ask, will a script work? A script should get the most of the way through a conversation in a static relationship, whereas in a dynamic relationship, a script will be more of a conversation starter. A dynamic relationship is one where we're always learning and adjusting about how we interact with the other person. These relationships grow and change over time and possibly even end. The biggest challenge for our young people is working out how to make those adjustments as the relationship changes. My daughter is still working on her conversational skills. Ask her to talk about herself and she's fine. But reciprocity in relationships is something she's still learning. I could joke here and say that we all know people who are still learning that skill. And one common error I've made is to speak too much for my daughter. And it really is finding that balance. It's very difficult to find a balance between supporting them to talk more, but not actually getting too involved in the conversation they might be having. One thing I've found when it comes to family relationships is that often family members don't always adapt their relationship with her. They don't see her necessarily as an adult. Maybe it's because often people prefer us as children and we're not quite as interesting when we grow up. And also suppose that she challenges the preconceptions about people with additional needs because she talks about things like getting a job and living independently. So I think that's just about people understanding that she's an individual as opposed to someone with additional needs. But one thing family relationships have helped her deal with is the concept of death. She has lost a grandparent and we tried to be as honest as we could and to prepare her as best we can. It wasn't easy and I know it's an area that can be a real struggle but I think it's important given that one day I'm going to leave her as well. When it comes to relationships, I think the thing that I hear people talk about most is a desire for their young people to have friends. I have that same desire for my daughter because social isolation is one of the biggest issues for people with additional needs. It's often called the silent killer, and that's one of the reasons I also believe quite passionately that my daughter needs a purpose, which I'll talk about more in the next episode. But to be frank, my daughter's 21. She doesn't have any close friends, so it's very much a work in progress. If I look back, I think she had one good friend when she was at school, between the ages of five and ten. Then she left that school, and over the years, geographical differences have limited the contact she's had with that person. But I really do hope that that young woman remembers their friendship with the same warmth that my daughter does. And one type of relationship we also need to think about is colleagues. My daughter wants to get paid work, and with that will come the dynamics of colleague relationships. Managing work relationships can be a massive challenge because it's inevitable that she'll be working with neurotypical people. And some of these people won't have experience of dealing with someone like my daughter. They won't understand some of the challenges that she has. And like I said before, they'll be afraid of getting things wrong. She's currently on a supported internship, so she has her job coach to help her navigate not only the work side of things, but also the relationship side of things. But once she goes into paid work, We've already realised that we'll have to take some of that job coach role on and have those conversations about how work is going. But having spoken to plenty of inclusive employers, I don't think I need to be too afraid. Her ability to deal with these situations will come with experience and it's about that positive risk, isn't it? There'll be times when I will need to step in, but there'll also be other times where I'll definitely need to step back 
and give her that chance to learn. And I'm sure like she does all the time, she'll surprise me with how well she does. When it comes to static relationships, the key is having scripts because the interactions are going to be the same. They're going to usually be quite short. They're usually going to follow the same script. So while relationships with colleagues at work will fall under dynamic, relationships with customers will definitely be static. And of course, there might be an outlier or two. If your young person works in a place where the same people come in every day, there could be a crossover where a relationship moves from static to more dynamic. I want to finish off by talking about three elements that I think we can use when it comes to thinking about building relationships and helping our young people manage relationships. And those three things are ability, access, and acceptance. The first one is ability. This is something that our young people don't necessarily start with, and it's something that we've all got to work on with them. Before I talk about the practical ideas that we can use to support our young people, I want to go back to that risk side of things. There are plenty of trials and tribulations in friendships, but the knowledge to deal with those will only come through having actual friendships, relationships with other people, where we make mistakes and we learn from them. So when it comes to the more practical skills and helping them develop those, the way to increase ability is the same as anything else when you're developing a new skill. It's all about learning, repetition, and practice. And when it comes to learning, it's all about scripts, not just verbal scripts, but also we're talking here about body language. Of course, this is an area our young people can struggle with, so I've always focused on the basics, not expecting my daughter to make eye contact, for example, because it's not something that she would feel comfortable doing. But she has learned to look interested when someone else is talking, and that's a definite life skill. There are some great resources available out there. Just search social scripts and you'll find some really useful examples. I've also put some links in the show notes. It really is going to depend on the situation and your young person. And you will need to adapt them to what your young person would actually feel comfortable saying. And from my own experience, it's important not to overload them. So keep it quite short, one or two sentences or questions. And developing their ability is an ongoing process. It's something that we all do every day when we try and get them involved in conversations. So while we can help them with their ability, we also need to think about access. If you think about where you met your friends, it was school, work, or an activity. And some of us even are lucky enough to have good friends that we made in school who are still our friends. But this didn't happen for my youngest daughter in the way that it did for my oldest, who still does have that friend from her very first school. So when it comes to access to friendships at school, there are a few factors that impact on our young people developing those friendships. As I've mentioned, one is around ability. And honestly, as I've seen my daughter mature, her ability to have relationships, to have friends has definitely got better as she's got older. But there were other factors as well. In my daughter's case, she went to a specialist school, which was mainly residential. She wasn't residential, but most of her classmates went home at the weekends and holidays. So the opportunities for developing a friendship past being in the same class were simply not there. The other issue is about perception. I've talked a little bit about losing friends, but it's also about perceptions of parents of other children. I have my own example of one parent who decided our children could no longer be friends. It was subtle, but it was there. And yes, my daughter's been excluded from birthday parties. Now, of course, I'm not saying that she would have necessarily had a great time at these parties. And I think the hurt was more on my side than hers. But I think the reality is that for most of our children, school is not the place where they will find these enduring friendships. So how do we improve access to friendships? Well, if your young person has moved on from school, but is still in some form of education like college or an interwork program, then there will be some opportunities there. But of course, some of the issues with those sorts of environments is that they're very large in terms of numbers of people that they have to interact with. So that can really make it quite difficult for young people to develop friendships when there's so many people around and it's a new environment and they just become quite overwhelmed I think that certainly happened for my daughter in some of the situations that she's been in but right now she's on the supported internship and her ability to develop friendships at that is limited partly I think because her focus is on the purpose side of things as opposed to developing relationships but it's also an awareness by everybody I think that this is a temporary thing that might move into a permanent job role and if it does I think that will then change the dynamics So we've had to look at access to friendships away from the work environment at this point in time. And there are a few things that we've done. It's been about joining clubs, getting involved in activities. I should mention online here, of course, my daughter isn't into gaming, but I know many young people who have made friends in that way. And I'm no expert in this area, but I guess if I was in that position, I'd want to have the online interaction mixed with some 
interpersonal interaction as well, just to help develop the skills, help increase the ability. The most success we've had so far is with a martial arts class near where we live. And it's something she does every week. And what I particularly like about this group is it's a group of people who, for the most part, are neurotypical. And we'll touch on acceptance a bit later. But this is definitely a group of people accepting of each other. And I see how keen she is to go to this class, which makes me realise how important that is to her. And of course, it's run by people who are naturally good at getting people with different abilities together and helping them learn off each other. Another one that's worked for us is Park Run. And before you ask, no, you do not have to run. You can volunteer. You can walk. Park Run is essentially one big social event, which just happens to involve some people running. My daughter has been doing this for a while now, and she really loves the social aspect, seeing the same people, and also the routine because it's every Saturday. Now, it's easy for me to talk about all the things that she does now, but she wasn't always keen on trying these new things. There's always some pushback when we try to encourage her to try something different. Honestly, most of us find new situations daunting. And for our young people who can often have communication issues or lack self-confidence, This is obviously massively amplified. So really, there needs to be a gentle transition period if it's at all possible. There certainly was for us. For quite a while, we waited in the room next door to the martial arts class. Now it's please drop me at the door and hopefully no one will see that you drop me at the door. And I'm expecting very soon that that will be please drop me around the corner. And once she moves to the next part of her independent travel training, we won't be allowed within 10 blocks of the place. I'll also add a caveat here. There have been some ideas that just haven't worked for her. In one case, she loved the activity, but the group weren't accepting, which made the whole experience negative for her. Perhaps one day we'll revisit that activity and find a more accepting community around it. I also realise that this part is not going to be easy because we don't want to upset our children. We don't want to stress them. We don't want to put them in situations that they don't like. But if we don't do anything, we already know what's going to happen. So in my mind, it's been worth dealing with those challenges, dealing with that pushback. And sometimes our time needs to be spent convincing them of their own potential, not only in terms of purpose and daily living, but also in terms of being someone who other people would value as a friend. So on to the final element, acceptance. In reality, we can help our young people manage ability and access, but not acceptance. And I think acceptance is really important because I think there's danger that when it comes to relationships, friendships in particular, that we will confine our children to a specific type of friendship. Sometimes we won't encourage other types of friendships because we think they're too risky. Now that might well be true, but all friendships have the capacity to go incredibly well and all friendships have the capacity to go incredibly badly. So it comes back again to this positive risk and also dignity of risk, which I mentioned in the last episode. I have to give my daughter the right to do this. It's also acceptance by us that they can have friends who aren't like them because we want other people in the world to have friends who aren't like them. So we must be willing to let our children go out there and have those friendships. And I'm not trying to minimise the obvious risks around vulnerability. As I talked about earlier, it's about making sure that an environment is supportive. When we talk about inclusion, we're not just talking about workplace inclusion, employers being inclusive. We're talking about inclusion in every aspect of our young people's lives. I think we also need to acknowledge as well that sometimes inclusion does not always lead to being included. Having said that, there are beacons of hope out there. One organisation I particularly love is called Stay Up Late. You can find out their story on episode 68. But essentially, the idea is that people with additional needs have a gig or sports buddy who they share that common interest with. There's no age limit, and it's about making events more accessible and connecting people and about making people feel included. It's only as my daughter has gotten older that I've seen how important relationships are as part of her long-term future. Perhaps because relationships aren't something that we notice as much. We think more about our children's ability to do daily living skills, or we think about their need for a purpose. But actually, relationships are just as important. Thanks for listening. I hope you got some ideas here that will help you in terms of supporting your young person to develop more relationships. Next episode, I'll be focusing on the purpose line. As always, I'd love to hear from you about how you've managed the relationships for your young person. You can get in touch with me on email 
deborah at expandingworlds.com or you can send me a message, find me online at Deborah Caldo.